let's go right into our non-duality discussion. Um, please take your time. So those coming out of the Hatha yoga class, do what you need to do. I'll take a little while to rev up anyway. I'll have to introduce the text and say a little bit about what we're doing and why we're doing it and all of that. So if you need to go and get some tea or set up your space in a different way, please feel free to do that. No rush whatsoever. I'm just going to ease into the next class. Shankara's Aparokshana Bhuti, which translates to the direct, immediate experience of truth or how to know Brahman is really what the text is about. Hello, Ryanji. Namaskaram. Welcome, welcome. So we've got some new people joining us in our Aparokshana Bhuti exploration. And that's wonderful because we're quite early on in the text. We're only now at verse four. And we're going to spend a little time sketching verses one through three to explain what verse four is about. So verse four is all about renunciation. And my main purpose today is to uh, ask the question, what is the value of renunciation in spiritual life? And I want to make a point that's entirely philosophical, mother willing, not cultural, not moralistic, but philosophical. I want to explain why in the context of non-dual experience, uh, renunciation is so important. What exactly is it and why do we need it? Bye, dear Madeline. Bye, bye. We'll miss you. <laughs> okay, so that's really what we're going to do today. But more than that, beyond talking about verse four of Aparokshana Bhuti, which is about renunciation, I'd like to motivate you to study non-duality. <laughs> I want to make the case that bhakti and jnana are mutually reinforcing. That when one does bhakti, practices like puja, like japa, like kirtan, when one engages with devotional practice in any capacity, one naturally is fitted for jnana. One becomes much more likely to attain to the highest truths of jnana yoga. One, in fact, falls into jnana inadvertently through bhakti. It, it's naturally the case that by loving something, you become one with the object of your beloved, non-duality. So bhakti enforces jnana and jnana enforces bhakti. So it's well known that anybody in the path of jnana typically is invited to practice bhakti. They're invited to have some kind of devotional practice. Shankara himself allegedly uh, initiated people into Shakti worship. He in invited people to worship the Sri Yantra, which obviously would be a very, very big feature of South Indian non-duality. Advaita Vedanta and South, and actually all over India, is very Sri Vidya oriented. And Sri Vidya is right here. But they all worship there. They do Lalita Sahasranama chanting. They read uh, Saundarya Lahari, which was allegedly composed by Shankara, this great poem to the mother. You know, they worship the Sri Yantra, which is a geometric expression of mother. So devotional practices are not... Um, few and far in between where non-duality is concerned in practice in all the mats of Shankara, you know, all the Shankaracharyas practice this. So obviously non-duality invites the practice of bhakti, but we have this sense that bhakti doesn't like non-duality, that somehow non-duality can harm bhakti. That might be the case, but today I'd like to really push for the understanding that no, actually jnana is not about the mind, it's about the heart. And when one approaches jnana in the right way, it deepens bhakti. It brings so much more out of our bhakti practice. And I think just to start off today's lecture, um, I'll say a few things. The greatest jnanis that I've ever met in my life have also been the most devotional people I've ever known. You know, so I think a good example might be Swami Sarva Pirandaji. Some of you have met him. And uh, Swami Mahayoganandaji was telling us this story. He went with Swami Sarva Pirandaji to a church. And after uh, some service or some talk, Swami Sarva Pirandaji does a full like Ashtanga Pranam. According to Swami Mahayoganandaji, he was taking a pranam in this church, so devotional before the cross. And from my time with Swami Sarva Pirandaji, when I hear him talk about Sri Ramakrishna, it's with such pathos, such feeling. You can tell that he really loves Sri Ramakrishna. And uh, when you see him in the temple, when he visits us in the summer, when he gets up after his meditations in the morning, he'll always bow to Thakur. And sometimes he's busy in the afternoon, so he's not there for the noon meditation, but he'll come in anyway and offer a flower to Sri Ramakrishna at the altar and then walk out. This is, the, this is the jnani par excellence of our time, arguably. If anybody comes into jnana yoga these days, it's typically through a Swami Sarva Pirandaji video. So people today study jnana yoga, Advaita Vedanta, largely because of his work. He's perhaps one of the most foremost voices in the understanding of jnana yoga in today's modern audience. You know, And... Uh, I think when we think of jnana, we think of someone like Swami Saravinanda, we think that, oh, this must be a very intellectual, dry kind of monk. But the truth of it is the actual opposite. is <laughs> the softest, sweetest, most loving, most devotional monk you would meet. You know, so loving, so soft, so in the heart. 
Why? Because there's no busyness in the mind. You know, when Swami Sarvapirandaji looks at you, he's looking at you, not at your body, not at your mind, but at you and, and you feel seen. And then you also feel like looking at him from that same place from which he's looking at you. And suddenly you enter into real love with somebody. People are deeply moved when they come into his presence. And I, I can really attest to this when he's there at the ashram, when he visits us, it's an air of festivity all around. Everyone comes and visits. We have to even get a valet. So many cars come and everyone's so festive and there's like such bhakti, you know, there's such joy and exuberance. There's like a veritable mart of bliss, as Sri Ramakrishna might say, when the jnani is in the house. And remember, this is a jnani. He does non-duality. He's all Advaita, Gaurapada. And, and let me just stress this further. Once we were on a walk and I asked him somewhat chillingly, you know, I asked him, so Swamiji, do you really mean to say that Gaurapada is the highest conclusion? in Advaita Vedanta. Remember, Gaudapada, who is Shankara's guru's guru, said, um, na nirodo, na cha utpati. There is no end to samsara because samsara never began. You see, Gaudapada is an ajati, meaning he subscribes to the philosophy called non-origination. If you ask an ajati, what is this world made of? They'll giggle at you and say, what world? If you say, what's all of this? You point at trees and mountains and the sky. They'll giggle and say, it's just Brahman. It's the blazing forth of consciousness. They don't see any trees, any mountains, any sky. They only see Brahman. So if you ask an Ajati what my life is, he'll say, oh, it's just a kind of illusion you get from spinning around a firebrand, a circle appearing in the night sky, just an illusion arising from very quickly moving phenomenon. It's very Buddhistic. This idea that it's all just void, essencelessness, emptiness. And, you know, it's thrilling. It's challenging. So I asked Swami Sarupinanda, do you, do you really mean to say that that's, that's the ultimate siddhanta, the ultimate conclusion? And Swami Sarupinanda ji, the sun is setting, by the way. So this is doubly chilling. He says in a very quiet voice, he speaks very quietly. He says, yes, obviously truth is beyond words. But as far as words go, yes, this is the ultimate truth. Na nirodho. There is no end to your suffering because there was no beginning to your suffering. He goes on to say, there are no spiritual seekers. Can you imagine? There are no such thing as spiritual seekers. Why? Because there are no bondages that you need to escape from. <laughs> so what spiritual seeking can happen when there's no bondage to escape from? And then he goes on to say, there is no seekers after liberation. No mumukshus. Why? Because there are no enlightened beings. I mean, isn't that crazy? Because enlightenment is not about, there's no such thing as an enlightened person. It's, it's wild. I mean, I'm not going to get into it. This is not a Gaudapada class. But my point is simply to say that this is the highest level of non-duality. It's an eerie kind of thing to consider. It's ajatavada, right? And I'm asking him point blank if he thinks that's the highest truth. And he says, yes. Without missing a beat, he says, yes. And he said it in such a way that the hairs on my, you know, all standing up, I had goosebumps. But it was so deeply peaceful and freeing mind was stunned into silence. And there was something more beautiful about the sunset that day. And the rest of the walk, we're talking about like ghosts and shit. So <laughs> it's, you know, having this kind of mystical conversation about everything else, but he's an Ajati. I mean, I'm not saying he's an Ajati. It's just that he said in response to that question that he thinks this is the highest that language can go. And then I even asked him, I said, surely Maharaj, this is a pedagogy, not a metaphysics. I'm trying to distinguish between a metaphysical statement and a pedagogical statement. And he's like, as far as it goes, yes, this is the highest metaphysics. So, I mean, this is just to say, you can take a jnani like Swami Sarvapinanda and, and see that the fruit of jnana is devotion. He's such a devotional person. Now let's take another case study, uh, Divyananda Prana Mataji. So she's also someone whose videos are getting a lot of traction on the internet. Someone who is really popularizing non-duality, especially in Indian universities. So she teaches at IIT and all these like kind of fancy Indian universities. Um, and she teaches Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta. And she teaches in such a grounded, practical way. So recently I had the pleasure of meeting her. She came here and we did a few retreats. So I went to San Diego to see her and I went to um, Santa Barbara to see her. And in San Diego, I asked her again, point blank. So is Gaudapada right? Na nirodho, na chaudpati? The world, you know, like, what do you think about that? Ajata vada. And she looks at me and again, with the same kind of breathless wonderment, her eyes are wide with joy. She says, yes, he's right. And I can't tell you the excitement that is expressed when these people say these things. Like the excitement in Swami Sarabhan, the joy 
the joy. Yes, that's a good question, Marcia. We'll come to it. Kalika has got a nice point here. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. And Eckhart Tolle to some degree, right? So anyway, this idea like um, the, these people, Divyananda Pranamataji, like Swami Sarvapadana, point blank said, yes, Gaudapada is right. And there was such joy in that statement. And I felt in that. And by the way, in the beginning of the retreat, I was like looking at her and, and whenever you see her, she's always like sitting, eyes closed. And, and that day she looked like Ananda Maima. She was really Ananda Maima, a bliss permeated mother. So she was sitting there head tilted in bliss. And then she opened her eyes and looked right at me. And it was such a strong contact high. I was like, oh my God. You know, and those who have met Swami Saraparanda, they report a similar thing. They feel in his presence, this contact high. And with Divyananda Pranamathaji also you feel it. Right, this kind of deep kind of transmission of joy. And these are the Gaurapada people, right? And now if you, to me, Divyananda Pranamataji, when she speaks, it's like Divine Mother herself is speaking. So over in Santa Barbara, we were talking about Shakti worship. Most of the time, I just want to ask her about Tantra, about Kundalini Shakti, because Divine Mother is here, I better ask her. <laughs> so we were talking a bit. And um, at lunch in Santa Barbara, she was explaining how all sadhana is Shakti sadhana. You know, why is it Shakti sadhana? Because um, Shakti means vitality. The vitality of one's body directed towards God, that's what Shakti Sadhana is. And God here is the non-dual absolute. So we're talking about how Bhakti, Jnana, Raja, Karma, all these different yogas are just ways to channelize my vitality. All Sadhana is Shakti Sadhana, to borrow a phrase from Divyananda Pranamataji. You know? Now, the devotion one feels from her is also par excellence. As I was leaving, the sun, again, sun is setting and uh, we're pulling out of the parking lot of Santa Barbara. And then I see her walking all by herself. She's coming down from the temple after Arati. So I open the car door, I run out, I take her leave, I take my pranam and I, I look up at her and she goes, Durga, Durga. And the way she said Durga, Durga, oh my God. You know, you say that typically when people are leaving, it's custom, Durga, Durga. But the way she said Durga, Durga, just the, the joy in the way that she was saying it. You know, the way that she prays to Shri Ramakrishna before she gives a talk to look at Sri Ramakrishna, you just sense that there's a kind of devotional nature there. And she is a jnani par excellence, right? She speaks on Advaita Vedanta. She's fully devoted to Advaita Vedanta like that. It, isn't that so interesting? So the two jnanis that we know publicly um, are two great bhaktas, Divya, Divyananda Prana, Pravrajika Divyananda Prana. Divyananda Prana, right? Let me put that in the chat. So isn't that interesting? I think that makes a very good case, right? For Jnana and Bhakti, that the most powerful spiritual practitioners that we meet are, are Jnanis, it seems like. And yet, they're the most devotional people that you'll meet. Doesn't, don't you think there must be something to that? There must be something to the power of Jnana if the Jnanis par excellence, like Swami Savarpinanda and Mataji Divyananda Pranaji are like, the most powerful. No, Swami Sarapinanda and uh, Divyananda Pranamataji are Gaurapada kind of people, right? You, if you watch their videos, you'll see they're very pro Shankara, they're very pro Advaita Vedanta, very pro Gaurapada. Vijnanavada is only about after Samadhi, after this transcendental experience, right? And we can have a deeper chat about that in the QA, but um, their approach is neti neti. Their approach is I'm not the body, I'm not the mind. I am pure awareness. The body and mind are appearances in me. They are, their approach is this world is a dream. You know, Swami Sarvapinanda in his talk, knowing and being, at the very end of this talk, someone tries to ask the question, but isn't this world real? Doesn't it invalidate my experience if you say the world is unreal? And you should, his response is the world is very much unreal. And this is why we have to say that. And he gives an explanation as to why it's important to say that. And you can refer to the second lecture in this series, Aprakshana Bhutti verse two, that lecture we said, when we say the world is unreal, we have to be very careful. Why would we subscribe to a philosophy that invalidates my every experience in life? No, no, no. That's not what is meant by mitya. Most people misunderstand the word mitya. Mitya just means this world has no ec extrinsic, sorry, intrinsic existence apart from me, the awareness in which it appears. So this world, obviously it appears. Who can deny that it appears? And it's beautiful. That the appearance is beautiful is also not to be denied. This is very important. The reason this world is beautiful is because it's an expression of me awareness. 
It has no existence outside of me. I am not a person in the world. The world is like a dreamlike, movie-like appearance in me. It's like a cloud floating across the clear, luminous expanse of my experience. You know, it's just like a wave arising and falling. It's, it's nothing really apart from me. It doesn't um, exist in and of itself. Does this become Gnostic? What does that mean, Karuna? Does this become Gnostic? I'm sorry. Like, does it become like demonizing of the world? Like nothing, you oh. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, I think, the misunderstanding of Advaita. It's like people don't, like when they don't understand the word mithya, they think what mithya means is invalidate my experiences. Like this world never appeared. No, no, no. Rather, what makes the world beautiful is that it's no big deal. There's nothing serious about it. Nothing can trap me in this world. I'm beyond it. I'm like super Teflon, as Swami Sarvapirna that like to say. Nothing can stick to me. And as such, I can glide through this world free and at ease and everything will delight me. So towards the end of that lecture, knowing and being, which to me was a very deep evening, you know, like it seemed like Swami Sarapinda was really interested in bridging the gap between intellectual knowledge and actually living from a place of Advaita Vedanta. So there's a kind of urgency in the talk and I highly recommend that talk. But uh, towards the end, he says to someone, the reason you have to call this world Mithya is because unless you do, you will always place between you and God the psychological superimposition of yours called time, space, causality, and form. So Desha, Kala, Nimitta, Vastu, these are all the categories whereby I conjure up this thing called a world. Now, this world, if it's real, then it's something, something apart from consciousness. God must be beyond the world or outside the world or within the world or part of the world or something like that. And if I look at something and I say it's a pot, I might miss the clay. So if I say there's no pot, then I'll see the clay. It's not that I stop seeing this thing that I previously called a pot. It's just that what I saw and previously called a pot, I am now seeing and calling clay. I'm calling it for what it really is. So the real function of mitya this philosophy of unreality of the world or illusory nature of the world is not to dismiss the world. It's just to help us overcome our world, our world of psychological superimpositions. So it, in some sense, is hubris to say that the world I see is the world that's actually there. It's fair, right? So this, this world that I see, this must be the world. This is what Shakti created. Not necessarily. I mean, this is what I created based on my understandings. You know, maybe if I drop that for a moment, I might be able to experience something deeper. But besides, philosophy aside, I just mean to say, if you look at Swami Sarvananda and Divinanda Pranamataji, what they teach is Shankara, Kevala Advaita, Shankara Advaita, you know, so much so that Swami Medanandaji and Swami Sarvapinandaji have a kind of healthy um, debate that's kind of an ongoing healthy debate, you know, because <laughs> and, and, and as a tantrika, you know, we, we would say both are correct you know, all, all experiences are valid. But I just mean, if you look at the person, not the philosophy, but the person, you sense a kind of depth, a depth in these non-dual masters, a devotion, a bhakti. Today, I'd like to explain why that's the case. Okay. One more thing I'd like to say now, typically it's not, it's not good practice to talk about mystical experience, but I feel particularly moved today. And this is, I think, an important topic. I really feel called to inspire everyone to take up a systemic study into, into jnana as a bhakti practice. And, and so I think it's valuable to share this next thing. So I was in San Diego, uh, Santa Barbara with Divinanda Pranamataji. Now, I'm not doing any puja. So I, it, I didn't do any Kali puja. I typically do puja for like an hour at least every day, if not 40 minutes at least every day. I'm very devotional in my practice. But this weekend, I wasn't doing any puja. Um, nothing devotional whatsoever, except for one arati one evening. And even then I was mostly in meditation for that arati. I was doing my non-dual practices. So I, and by the way, the whole day had passed in meditation. We had the workshop in the morning with Divinanda Pranamataji. We had a little bit of lunch. And then after that, I spent the rest of the day just in nature meditating. And it's all non-dual meditation. I'm just doing non-dual stuff, right? And the whole weekend passes immersed in just hour upon hour of non-dual meditation, no bhakti whatsoever. And then I come home and I come to the altar and, you know, I place a flower. I don't, not yet, but I sit in front of uh, Kalima and I, I, I thank her, thank her for the, you know, the experience of seeing her manifest the Divinanda Pranamataji and the whole wonderful thing. And I felt a bhakti like I never felt before. It was like touching the spaciousness of that space. I finally understood the line in the Maha Nirvana Tantra that Mother Kali is black as the void. As the color black dissolves all names and forms, so too does she dissolve uh, oh, sorry, as the color black dissolves all colors, so too does Kali dissolve all name and form. She is the devourer. 
So Mother Kali devours all the five senses of action, the five senses of perception, the five subtle elements, the five gross elements. She dissolves the four levels of the mind, manas, buddhi, chitti, ahanka, chitta, ahankara. She dissolves all of that. And in that deep experience whereby no uh, phenomenon is felt, there is a beauty and aliveness inherent in that. So Divyananda Pranamataji again says beautifully that uh, happiness is an exponential function of awareness. So if one enters into that luminous space where there are no thoughts and really no world, one feels an alertness, an enlivenment, a joy, a lucidity, a beauty, unlike anything else. And that beauty is so sweet that it draws one into engaging with these kind of Himalayan traditions like Kashmir Shaivism and uh, all these other non-dual traditions, right? Vigyana Bhairava, Mahamudra, Advaita Vedanta, like these Gaudapada, these very lofty transcendentalist kind of traditions. So I was obsessed with that line in the Maha Nirvana Tantra. I, I don't know why, but that black absorbing color, Makali absorbing all things. And I even did that lecture, Makali and the void of Tibetan Buddhism. Like I was kind of interested in that inquiry because every Tuesday when it came time to worship Makali, I really just felt like reading Prasangika Madhyamika texts. You know, I was obsessed with the progressive stages of meditation on emptiness. Like I just, for some reason, wanted to do non-dual meditation during Tuesday Kali worship. I don't know why, but I was just feeling that there was this void element in Mother Kali. And then, you know, Sri Ramakrishna, when he was asked once, he was in this abstracted mood, he came out of Samadhi and he said, um, tell me your questions, I will clear your doubts. And the first question that was asked, a devotee asked him, why is Mother Kali of black complexion? And I'm going to read some from the gospel just to kind of back up these statements. Uh, he says, I'm just paraphrasing now, I'm going to look at it close, more closely in a bit. He says something like this. She only looks black when you look at her from a distance, just like the water in the lake appears black when you look at it from far away. If you go closer and you take the water in your hand, you'll notice that it's colorless. So Mother Shyama, Mother Kali is colorless. Shankara calls this nirvishesha or nirguna without any special attributes. You know, Brahman is void. It's void of any attributes. It doesn't have a form or a color. It's pure spacious awareness, my very own essence nature, the subject. That is what Kali is the closer you go, you know. So we get these, these metaphors like the closer you go to the Ganga, the more cooling it feels. Yeah, uh, she appears like an ocean, yes, in light. Exactly. So, and by the way, Sri Ramakrishna's first experience of Kali was not a lady with arms, not at all. He only had that experience later and it was a valuable experience, but the first experience was sag, uh, Saguna Nirakara, just a mass of light. So he saw this formless light and, and then he had the Nirguna experience. So in there, he's talking about Kali, but in her Nirguna aspect, okay? So I'm about to now make the point, the point that I'm kind of circling around. This Nirguna aspect of Kali, he describes it by talking about her colorless complexion from very near. So do you see why Bhakti turns into Jnana? Because if you go so close to God, eventually you realize God is also formless. You start with God with, with form, and you go close enough to God, you, see, you go through that form, you realize what the form was, what Sri Ramakrishna is, is it's just a Maya-shaped hole. Do you know what I mean? If you look at Jesus or Buddha or Sri Ramakrishna, what you're seeing is a glitch in Maya. And you almost look in and through and, and, and see this vastness and this spaciousness. That's why the Dhyana Mantra for Sri Ramakrishna is um, Hridaya Kamala Madhye, Rajitam Nirvikalpam. <laughs> that which sits resplendent in the middle of the lotus of the heart, beyond all thought, thoughtless. You know, one without a second, eka swarupam, prakriti vikriti shunyam. No, no, don't worry. We're, I'm going to tell you why uh, takur is takur. So there's, there's two, these, these two aspects are there. So nirguna and saguna are there. You see, it's very important. You can easily get caught in one or the other. Those who are saying, oh, Kali is only colorless, there's a mistake. But those who say, no, she cannot be colorless, you're missing out on a whole aspect of mother. Okay, hold on, I'm coming to it. So um, Kali is colorless, right? Now, Swami Vivekananda used to challenge Sri Ramakrishna's Kali all the time. You know, he would say, oh, these are hallucinations because he would talk to her. He would say, oh, mother, why have you only given him a particle Oh, I see. That will be enough for him. All right. You know, she's like, talk. He talks to Mother Kali. Please attract him, Mother. You know, please bring him to you. She's always talking. He's talking to her in a personal saguna kind of way. But when he talks to Swami Vivekananda, young Narayan, about this stuff, um, he says to him, What you call Brahman, I called Kali. So, what you call Brahman, I call Kali. So, he's saying Kali is this Nirguna. It's a Nirguna kind of aspect. Okay. So, another time, I was talking to Professor Staneshwar Timal Sinaji. 
Now, my grandfather, he's a lot like, oh, okay, sorry, I'll give you another example. So we, we took these two examples, Swami Sarupanandaji, Swami Divya Prana, uh, Divyananda Pranamathaji. I like these examples because they're very contemporary. Many of you will meet these people and you can verify the statement your, yourself. You can watch their videos and see their Kevala Advaita stance and you can meet them and ask them about Gaudapada and about Kevala Advaita and you see that they're Gyanis par excellence and then you realize that they're also the greatest bhaktas you'll ever meet with the highest spiritual acumen ever. I think that's an important observation. Second, let's look at a historical example, Utpala Deva. Now, Utpala Deva is a Shaiva master. He composed the text Ishvara Pratya Bhikya Karika, commentary on the, or uh, stanzas on the recognition of God. Now, it's a very sophisticated, nuanced, non-dual masterpiece. And in that text, Shiva is not a blue fella, right? Shiva is consciousness, that uh, essence, nature, which is formless. So whenever they talk about Shiva, they're talking like Sri Ramakrishna about the colorless Kali, this spaciousness, right? Okay, so he's a philosophical master, a Gyani par excellence. And then you read Shiva Sotravali. So you read Ishvara Pratya Bhikya Karaka next to Shiva Sotravali, you'll be like, what is going on here? This philosopher, this Gyani, this intellect par excellence is also the most raving madman bhakta you could ever imagine, right? Shiva Sotravali means garland of hymns to Shiva. He talks to Shiva in this beautiful nectarian way. Now the commentator, the tantric commentator, Harish Saurabh or Christopher Wallace, he actually said about the Kaula masters that you find in their writings throughout nine lineages, the same nectarian ecstasy wedded to piercing insight. Nectarian ecstasy, bhakti, wedded to piercing insight, jnana. What makes a master in the Shaiva tradition, in the Tantric tradition, is jnana and bhakti. But why? Why? Let me tell you. This is the most important thing. Because God is both formless and with form. So if you just go the bhakti route, you have dismissed an entire aspect of Kali, her nirguna form. How can you know something by only knowing one side of it? And worse, if you go just the nirguna route, you've ignored her entire saguna aspect. You've, you've denied yourself the sweetness of devotion. You see, so jnanis have cut mother in half and only taken the half they wanted. Bhaktas have cut mother in half and taken only the half that they wanted. And you have split your vitality in two. You have decided that you are a, a, a one-dimensional being, that you're just all heart and not any head. Then you've decided that you're all head and not any heart. Why would you do that to yourself? Why would you do that to mother? Instead, why not say, no, I am a multifaceted being. I am an intellect. And insofar as I'm intellect, that's what jnana yoga is for. I am a cognitive, uh, not only a cognitive being, I'm an effective being. And that's what bhakti is for. I am an active being. That's what karma is for. And I'm a meditative being. That's what raja is for. So to do shakti sadhana is to harness your whole vitality, intellect and heart, and direct it to God. So insofar as God is both these things, nirguna and saguna, then it only makes sense that approaching one will reveal something about the other. So if you go completely bhakti, you will also discover the nirguna. And if you go completely nirguna, you will also discover the saguna. If you look at Thich Nhat Hanh's poems, for instance, or like like these Vajra songs, you know, there's these Vajrayana masters who just walk around the world, just renunciants par excellence composing poems <laughs> to female deities you know like you'll see there's a poetry that arises from jnana and there's a knowledge that arises from bhakti utpala deva this great shaiva master is i think a great example of that so my grandfather is a lot like i mean to me he's like utpala deva because he he was so non-dogmatic he loved shiva right he was a bhakta for Shiva par excellence. And he spent most of the time by himself in the ashram, like quietly praying to Shiva, you know? Um, and I often asked him about like his views on Vaishnavism and stuff like that. One thing he really didn't like was dogmatism. So he really didn't like when he would walk into a place and they would exalt Vishnu over Shiva. He's like, no, they're equal. At least have them on the same platform. Why put Shiva down here and Vishnu up there? So he was very against dogmatism. But he wasn't like part of the Sri Ramakrishna lineage or, or anything like that. I really think it was because he discovered what Shiva was in essence, the non-dual absolute. And that allowed him to see that all forms of God are really just various expressions of one absolute, right? And that's what allowed him to say to me when I was a very young boy, uh, yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. I would have all these ideas. I would look at the fire and say, Tata, I'm not worshiping this picture of Shiva anymore. Forget the Shiva lingam. I'm going to worship fire. This fire is more Shiva than the Shiva Lingam. I'm no longer doing the Shiva Lingam Puja. He'd say, yes, you're right. 
You're absolutely right. Go that way. <laughs> you see, it didn't matter to him. He knew that God was formless. And so he could have any of these forms. You see, my Tata was not part of the Sri Ramakrishna lineage. Yet he had that Sri Ramakrishna Bhava. Why? I think it's because he realized the Nirguna aspect of Shiva. That Shiva is not a blue guy, right? I think he was able to see that Shiva was pure consciousness. And therefore, he was just as happy worshipping fire as he was the Lingam. As he was a blue color Shiva, as he was, you see? There's a kind of flexibility that you get if you ac uh, access the Nirguna. So now that's Utpala Deva. That's my grandfather, right? Now, what about Swami Vivekananda? Remember, to understand Ramakrishna, you must go through Vivekananda. Vivekananda is the voice of Ramakrishna, right? He's like, he's the ambassador of Ramakrishna's message, which was very diverse, very esoteric. He's the interpreter of Ramakrishna. What is Swamiji's stance? He seems to be a Gyani par excellence. And obviously this is debated hotly, but he says in many places, one alone exists. It appears as nature, soul. You know, so for a kind of Kevala Advaita Shankara reading of Swamiji, we can look at Swami Ashokananda. Swami Ashokananda, a disciple, is interpreting Swami Vivekananda in this very jnana-oriented way. So I don't think anybody can deny that Swami Vivekananda is a jnani par excellence, right? However, Sri Ramakrishna would often say about him that he has the eyes of a bhakta, big lotus eyes. He has the face of a devotee. If you see what Swamiji says about Sri Ramakrishna, you can see that he's perfected Dashya Bhava, the attitude of servant. Or when you hear him talk about Mother Kali, you can see that he's mastered the attitude of Matri Bhava, the, the love of the mother. So Swami Vivekananda is a bhakta par excellence, yet he's a jnani through and through. When he teaches, he teaches jnana. Why? Because it's fortifying. It gives strength. He says, atheism used to be not believing in God. I say, the new atheism is not believing in yourself. So this idea, like if you just go the path of the heart, there are two risks. One is dogmatism. If you don't touch the formless absolute, you will start to believe that your form is the only form. You know, you won't have that intellectual acumen to see that actually beyond the form is a principle and that principle is present in all traditions. So be wary because if you just go the path of the heart, love can make us into overly sentimental and dogmatic fanatics. It happens. It happens in all these bhakti traditions. You know, they start to kind of like feel averse to other traditions. And that's not in keeping with the Ramakrishna Bhava of like harmony of all traditions, you know, to be able to enjoy religion where you meet, where you see it. So that's the first thing. That's the first risk. The second risk is the nerves can get a little fragile. So too much mystical experience and too much emotion uh, can cause a lot of depression. Like swings will happen. So Sri Ramakrishna gives the example of the uh, ice. The bhakta is like an ice floating in the Ganga, right? It goes under and it goes up. So there, there are a lot of emotions. If you don't have jnana, if you don't hold on to the raft of jnana, you're going to be smashed this way and that by your emotions. Your emotions will take control over you. It's a powerful thing, but that which can cook can burn. So without jnana, without the kind of acumen of jnana, you can be overwhelmed by the emotions of bhakti. So Swamiji is always kind of giving us jnana so we don't get scared. So we say strong. What fear, my friends? What fear? Stand up and fight. Like you get that vibe from Swamiji, which comes from knowing that I am the truth. So that intellectual acumen gives you like that masculinity that balances the femininity of bhakti. They, they go together. You know, they're Shiva and Shakti, not just Shakti, not just Shiva. So that's why you get that from Swamiji. So he is a bhakta, yet teaching jnana. Jnana through and through. So if one reads Swamiji, one cannot avoid the jnana in it. Everywhere, karma yoga is jnana, it's a jnana text. Raja yoga is a jnana text. Jnana yoga is a jnana text. His inspired talks, you know, it's really kind of solid jnana. Hmm? Okay, then final thing I'm going to say with, with, with regards to, to this. Yeah, 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 that's, that's what I'm going to say. The renunciation comes through jnana and bhakti comes through renunciation. So that's kind of the main reason we're going to take up Shankara's verse four. Like what is renunciation? Why does it matter? But I'm coming exactly to that point that a bhakta needs a lot of renunciation and you get renunciation just by loving God. Automatically renunciation happens naturally through loving God, but renunciation can be helped through the path of jnana yoga. We'll make that case in just a moment. But I'm going to talk now a little bit about Professor Staneshwar Timal Sinaji. So he's the acharya that teaches the, um, Devi Mahatmya course that some of you have been attending and I've been with him for some time now and following along with some of his courses and I asked him once about um, something I asked him when did the Shaivas become Shaktas I was asking for a historical point when did all the Kashmiri Shaiva masters suddenly become goddess worshippers you know did it happen from within the tradition or was this like something from outside the tradition affecting the tradition 
So how did that exactly happen? And he said, um, what you're looking for is false knowledge. He said, if you know this, it will make you sound smart. I'm paraphrasing, but it won't actually help you in your sadhana. This is not a right question to ask. And he pointed out that this question is coming from an overly dualistic point of view of thinking Shiva and Shakti are different, but they're not because Shiva and Shakti are not a man and a woman. It's, it's their principles. Shiva is awareness and Shakti is the vitality of that awareness. Once he was able to show me the esoteric side of Shiva and Shakti, I realized the futility of my questions in trying to understand different sects. And then when I looked at the Shaiva masters again with these fresh eyes, I realized, oh, this is why they had such range. You know, Utpala was able to speak from the point of view of Shambhava Upaya. Uh, Abhinava Gupta was able to speak from the point of view of Shakta Upaya and then Anava Upaya. And then Shema Raja could speak from the point of view of, you know, like you see all these Shaiva masters, um, they just had this range because they knew their bhakti was not confined to a particular form. It was for the formless expressing itself as that form in that moment. So it seems like the jnana in, enhanced the bhakti, you know? So that's one reason why I think it's a false dichotomy. I, I, I just cannot escape the conclusion that the greatest bhaktas I met have been jnanis par excellence. So my invitation then is to say this. Don't think of jnana as the path of the head. It's not an intellectual inquiry. It's an inquiry of the heart. But if it feels uncomfortable, actually, that's, that's also valuable because it's kind of, the reason it's uncomfortable is because it challenges the kind of traditional ways we see ourselves and the world. And that might be valuable insofar as all growing involves growing pains. It might actually be valuable to challenge ourselves in that way. Um, and it's especially helpful if we are grounded in the bhakti practice. If we're just doing jnana without bhakti, there's a problem. You know, bhakti must always be there. That's, that's a given. It's the path par excellence, you know? Okay, so that's why I would say this, the text that we're studying like Aprokshana Bhutti or any of these texts, Shankara is writing the Aprokshana Bhutti. It's a jnana text, but it's a system. It's very systematic. So you follow through from verse one all the way to the end and you learn the whole text. It's like learning a whole system. You know, and that system is designed to bring us into contact with the nirguna aspect of Mother Kali or the nirguna aspect of Shiva or, or Vishnu or whatever else, this kind of formless aspect. By touching that formless aspect, my feeling is that the aspects of form, our relationship with those will deepen. We'll feel closer to those. You know, that's one claim. So by interacting with the nirguna, we can also discover saguna and vice versa. As we continue in our bhakti practices, these texts will just make more sense. As we get purity through bhakti, it will, this won't feel so disturbing because if it, if it feels that way, we're doing it with our mind. We should be doing it with our heart, which requires, of course, a lot of preliminary work as Shankara spells out in verse three. Okay, so that's the first claim that if you touch nirguna, you will also touch saguna, right? That's the first claim. So to know Mother Kali, I, I, this is probably not a good example, but remember how Chancellor Palpatine in episode three of Star Wars said, if one is to learn of the force, one must learn about it in all of its aspects, not just the dogmatic view of the Jedi. <laughs> I know I don't really want to portray us as the dark side of the force right now, but somehow that came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> but if one is to understand the force, one must study it in all of its aspects, including the dark void mother, Nitya Kali or Mahakali, as Sri Ramakrishna calls it, as well as Shyamakali and all those others. So um, if you touch Nirguna and you can touch it, like this, remember, Aprokshna Bhutti is not a study, it's a practice. The study of Advaita Vedanta is the practice of it. So as you're going through, all of this is a guided meditation. It's just what we experienced when Divyananda Pranamathaji guided us in that old meditation. Please don't misunderstand. Jnana yoga is all through and through a, gu a guided meditation. Yes. You know, you know what Shankara would say to you in Aprokshna Bhutti? In each and every verse, he would say, are you feeling it now, Mr. Krabs? <laughs> because it's about feeling. It's about knowing. Okay. It's not about um, learning. Don't think it's like intellectual. No, no. It's a guided meditation. So if we understand that jnana, really the whole thing is a guided meditation meant to point out something that's even now available, it will be a bhakti experience. Why? Now the second thing I'm going to say, why is Aprokshana Bhutti a, a, a bhakti experience? <laughs> Imagine, <laughs> imagination. <laughs> why is this a bhakti experience? Um, and maybe this is me speaking from 
a personal experience. I had an experience in the Malibu Hindu temple, actually, of this, where I was like, I don't want to stand in front of Muruga. Because, you know, there's Muruga there and there's Shiva and there's Ganesh and you make your circumambulation. So after Ganesh, you go to Shiva and I just want to be with Shiva. But a priest had hustled me. So I had to go from Shiva to Muruga. And I was just like looking at Muruga and I was like, but I want to be in front of Shiva. And then I had an experience at that temple, realizing that like, wait, this is stone. This isn't Muruga. This is stone. What is stone? Stone is consciousness. What is consciousness? Consciousness is Shiva. This is Shiva. And then I looked, I was like, that's Shiva. And then I ran to the Vishnu temple, which was over there. And I was like, oh my God, Shiva. Because I realized Shiva is not a blue guy. He's not a, he's not a cultural, Shiva is consciousness. And as insofar as that's inherent in every one of my experiences, I'm always worshiping Shiva. Like we see in the Saundarya. La, ha, la, ha, ha. Yeah. <laughs> Shiva destroys. <laughs> so, <laughs> smash because <laughs> he's opening your eyes your, your third eye you don't need the glasses anymore now you see with your inner vision <laughs> okay so anyway um this experience of aprokshana bhuti remember the text is called aprokshana bhuti right which means well i didn't even pull out the text today uh which means the experience of uh pure awareness the experience knowing brahman aprokshana bhuti means knowing brahman so this is what happens this is my second claim, why jnana is actually a bhakti experience. When you experience this aprokshana bhuti, remember, you're not studying or learning. This is just pointing out something. And once you get the view and you feel it, then, you know, when you feel aprokshana bhuti, the ego drops away. In other words, the illusion of self is made apparent. So I realize I am nothing, actually. There was never a niche. There never will be a niche. There is not even now a niche. I have nothing to do with niche. Doesn't that make me a super bhakta? The whole point of bhakti is to efface the, the niche, to say, thy will alone be done. So actually, uh, the experience of aprokshana bhuti is the experience of thou and thou alone. There is no me left in that to say, I love you, God. No, it's just God. Really, the sentence is love God. There's no I love God anymore. It's just love God. And that's deeper. That's more, that's closer to God than me standing here loving God. It's better if I'm gone altogether and only God is. In fact, if I truly love God, I wouldn't just be giving her flowers at puja. I should give her all of this. So what is aprokshana bhuti? It's when all of this is given to Kali. It dissolves. It dissolves in the sense that one realizes one is not this. So this aprokshana bhuti, this experience, this experience of formless awareness is a bhakti experience because it effaces the ego. So referring to Swamiji's lecture, um, self-abnegation is, what was it called? Remember that um, it's called self-abnegation. I, I forgot what it's called. But remember that the, there was a lecture about self-abnegation, how it's like the goal of all the yogas. It appears in the beginning of volume one, uh, Karma Yoga. He says like the highest yoga, true renunciation is self-abnegation. So if I have this Aprokshana Bhuti experience, that's the experience of not I, but thou. Mm -hmm. That's why all these jnanis become bhaktas because there's no ego left. It's only just God there. So they're all so devotional. God flows through them. There's no person there anymore. And that's helpful for bhakti. It's very, it, that's the point of bhakti actually to self-abnegate as Swamiji argues. So that's my second claim. The reason why studying texts like this is very important is not only because um, one can appreciate all forms of spirituality, but also because um, the very experience of Aprokshana Bhuti is a meditative experience of pure consciousness, which is God. You know, I remember how Swami Vivekananda, he set up a place in Mayavati. I think this is a good, good example. So Swami Vivekananda, he set up an ashram in Mayavati. It's the Advaita Ashrama. He forbade all ritualism there. So there is to be no puja, no bhakti practice. It's just hardcore, no nonsense, Himalayan Advaita. And one day he went to visit his project and he saw the rascals had put a picture of Thakur there. And he said, oh, the old man has snuck in somehow or something like that in Bangla, he said. So the old man made it here too. And he was pissed. He demanded the picture be taken down. Now, of course, these monks in Mayavati felt like that was not appropriate. This is their master. So they wrote to Ma Sharada, hoping that Ma Sharada would take their side. Ma, Ma, as you should run to your Ma when brother is up doing this. He goes to Ma, Ma, look what he did. Swami Vivekananda said, we can't keep a picture of Thakur here. And you know what Ma Sharada wrote? She wrote back. This happened. She wrote back and she said, he was right to do what he did. Narin was right in what he did. Your master was non-dual. Ma Sharada says that. Your master was non-dual. Why does she say that? Be she didn't say your master is a non-dualist. No, no, no. She said your master is non-dual. 
ಹೃದಯ ಕಮಲ ಮಧ್ಯೆ ರಾಜತಾಂ ನಿರ್ವಿಕಲ್ಪಂ ಸದ ಸದ ಅಖಿಲ ಭೇದಾತಿತ ಏಕಸ್ವರೂಪಂ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿ ವಿಕೃತಿ ಶೂನ್ಯ ಏಕಸ್ವರೂಪಂ ಸಿ ನಿತ್ಯ ಆನಂದ ಮೂರ್ತಿ ಲೈಕ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಮಂಗಲ ಶ್ಲೋಕ ಐ ಮೀನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಧ್ಯಾನ ಮಂತ್ರ ದಟ್ ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಈಸ್ ನಾನ್ ಡುವಲ್ ಹಿ ಈಸ್ ದಟ್ ಅಬ್ಸಲೂಟ್ ಆಸ್ ವೆಲ್ um no no that's what you should say gyana yoga is all about saying i'm a worm i'm nothing i'm nobody but you don't just say that you see that you see the point about gyana yoga is it shows you the truth of bhakti because in bhakti you say okay i'm nothing i'm nobody in gyana yoga you're like oh my god i'm right i am nobody you see you like realize it aprokshna bhuti is when you realize you're a worm and not even that you're less than a worm you don't exist <laughs> the greatest self abnegation it's the ultimate putting down of the ego hmm? a lot of people misunderstand advaita because they think the i here refers to the ego you know but it doesn't it's beyond the ahankara manno buddhi ahankara chitani naham okay so now um where were we oh your master was non dual masharada says i think that's a very important point so she supported mayavati ashram so isn't that interesting shri ramakrishna's shakti masharada supports the mayavati ashram she supports the the existence of an ashram in which no dualistic puja whatsoever happens because the master was non dual that's an important point actually i think now one day uh, ma sharada is speaking to um arupananda swami i think and he says but uh, she says this world is a dream my child so, ma sharada says that she says this world is a dream my child and if you want citations for all of this i'll find it for you but it's there in the ramakrishna vivekananda literature she's saying this world is a dream that's a gyana gyana kind of statement this world is a dream my child and then swami arupananda i believe he he argued he said but mother surely there's a difference between waking and dreaming right like the waking world is more real than dreaming in these ways and there are ways that you can try to draw a distinction shankara himself wouldn't go so far Shankara himself says this world vyavaharika is more real than the pratibhasaka dream. Gaurapada would say no waking and dreaming are equally unreal. <laughs> But Shankara even Shankara wouldn't go so far to say this world is a dream. Ma Sharada mother she who she is who is Ma Sharada? Janto Durga right? The living Durga. So Ma Sharada who is Kali herself is saying this world is a dream. Isn't that interesting? Then this guy says, "No, no, Swami Arup, no, no, not not this guy, <laughs> Swami Arupananda ji." <laughs> He's saying, um, "But surely the world is more real." And apparently, Ma Sharada burst out laughing. I guess as only Kali can. She bursts out laughing and she says, "Be that as it may, my child, this world is a dream." She didn't feel the need to argue beyond that. "Be that as it may, my child, this world is a dream." Oh, you get chills. When Tota Puri came to teach Ramakrishna. um nirvikalpa samadhi the highest you know gyana yoga experience uh ramakrishna said let me go ask my mother first right let me go ask my mother and totapuri thought ramakrishna was such a naive boy he just he's actually going to ask his like earthly mother <laughs> he's like going to go talk to his like actual amma yeah lo and behold he went to his actual amma ma kali and you know what ma kali told him this is mother kali right mother kali told sri ramakrishna to go and get nirvikalpa samadhi <laughs> that's important i think it's an important point that mother kali mahamayi herself instructed sri ramakrishna to go and get nirvikalpa samadhi gave him her permission no she didn't tell him to go do it she gave him her permission to do it and brought the teacher to him to do it and then he showed totapuri the view after nirvikalpa samadhi which is vigyanavada so remember why say that the steps are made of brick brick dust and lime if you haven't yet discovered that the roof is made of that in many places shri ramakrishna says you have to do discrimination discernment between sat and asat asat sat asat vichara that's in the bangla sat asat vichara you know figure out the truth first go up to the roof then then you walk down and you see that the steps are made as the same material as the roof but you got to get to the roof first this is to go to the roof aprokshna bhuti is one of the ways to try to get to the roof to get to nirvikalpa samadhi and from that point of view now vigyanavada starts do you see vigyanavada starts after you get to the roof after you have nirvikalpa samadhi then you realize that consciousness has become all of this this whole world is rush soaked in consciousness but for us we're sadhakas we're not philosophers we're not pandits we're not interested in articulating in a scholastic way what shri ramakrishna's school of philosophy was no we're interested in getting there you know yeah yeah exactly and how do you get vigyana first you must go into samadhi right you must first have the highest experience 
So one last citation. This is from Swami Brahmananda. So once someone had asked Ramakrishna to summarize everything in one word. He said, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Like one sentence. Someone asked for a teaching. Can you, can you put all of this in one sentence? And Sri Ramakrishna said, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. God alone is real. This world is false. Digest this. Then he said, assimilate this. And then he kept quiet. Swami Brahmananda reports that. You know. So this is, this is what I'm... Uh, isn't the balance? Yeah. Um, very good question. So what exactly is Vijnana? Well, you could say it's Shakta Advaita, right? Like Shakta Advaita is the statement that this world is not an appearance in Brahman. It's a real manifestation of Brahman. So the, in, in Vedanta... It's not Shakti, it's Maya. So Maya, she, there's, Maya is just, it's, it is and it isn't. It's like a function of Brahman, whereby Brahman, the one, appears to be the many. But Maya itself is not a thing. Therefore, it doesn't need to be explained. It just needs to be transcended. So this is a Maya transcending device, Aprochanabhuti. That's according to Vedanta. But according to Tantra, it's not Maya, it's Mahamayi, it's Shakti. So she is not... She's not nothing. She's metaphysically speaking, the power whereby Brahman makes all of this happen. So Shakti, she's the ability for Brahman to conjure up this world of name and form. So to get to Brahman, I must go through Shakti. So now Shakti Sadhana becomes possible. So the language of Shakta Advaita is two types of things. And I think we have to be very careful to distinguish between Siddhanta, which means metaphysical statement, and Upaya, which means way. We must not, I think, as sadhakas, be too quick to um, claim like, you know, yeah, yeah, he does. This is Shakta Advaita. And, and that's the way I think Shankara does too, actually, honestly. I mean, why, why else would he teach um, Sri Vidya worship? You know, like this is what I'm saying. There's a difference between absolute truth and the language you use to get there. Truth is beyond all language. The salt doll went to measure the ocean. How could it tell the depth? Brahman is the only thing that hasn't been defiled by the tongue. It cannot be spoken of. You see, truth is way beyond the mind. Sri Ramakrishna would not affirm truth any more than the Buddha would. It's a great mistake to say this is true. No, nothing the mind says is true is true. It's all just hubris. Hubris to say this is the way it is. No, it's not that way. It's way more complicated than that and way more simple than that because ultimately it's beyond the mind, right? So all that we have to be interested in is sadhana. Our only goal right now is not to be pandits. We're not writing a paper. We're not trying to formulate what the school of philosophy that he belongs to is. We're trying to understand what is the most efficacious way of, of, for us to enter into the master state of mind. How can we become vigyanis? You know, how can we have the experience that everything around us is saturated with consciousness? It seems like by taking advantage of everything, by using the whole uh, gamut of my, my shakti, as a bhakta, as a jnani, as a karma yogi, as a raja yogi, all of it must be brought together. All my vitality must be harnessed, right? So I think, you know, if you look at the Vijnana Bhairava and if you look at Svaba, Bodha, Daya, Manjari, there's a lot more going on in Tantra than meets the eye. And what I see happening in Tantra is a lot like what happens in Sri Ramakrishna, where it's like du duality is great. Duality is true. Let's act dualistically. Qualified non-duality is awesome. Let's go that way for a while. Non-duality is awesome. Let's do that for a while. Let's do all of these things together. It's never one or the other. So you know what I would say Vijnana is? I would say Vijnana is the Shakta Advaita view that all these paths are valid and they all correspond to different levels of experience. And now we're going to talk about the Advaita level of experience. You can call it the highest or the lowest. It doesn't matter how you place it, um, but it doesn't change that it is conducive to, to, to sadhana. And this is why. Because it gives us renunciation. The greatest gift that you can get from jnana yoga is renunciation. You know? So let's see here this statement. Um, and I think this is good. We can, I, we can open up the Q&A and like really just um, you know, talk about this a little more because I think especially because it's really important that we understand this so that we don't miss out on the depth and breadth of what we're getting here right I think this is a valuable inquiry as to what role does jnana yoga play and, and especially in the master's teachings as well um, okay so this is that statement right Govinda is asking revered sir why does the divine mother have a black complexion so this is page 271 the master says you see her as black because you are far away from her. Interesting. Go near and you will find her devoid of all color. 
The water of a lake appears black from a distance. Go near and take the water in your hand, and you will see that it has no color at all. Similarly, the sky looks blue from a distance, but look at the atmosphere near you. It has no color. The nearer you come to God, the more you will realize that he has neither name or form. If you move away from the Divine Mother, you will find her blue like the grass flower. Is Shyama male or female? And then he tells that story about the sacred thread, you know. Anyway, um, that which is Shyama is also Brahman. That which has form, again, is without form. That which has attributes, again, has no attributes. Brahman is Shakti. Shakti is Brahman. They are not two. These are only two aspects, male and female, of the same reality. Existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. So this is the most important point I want to make. Please don't take Shakti without Shiva. Don't take Shiva without Shakti. These are not two. They are one. Don't see jnana as jnana. It's a bhakti practice. Don't see bhakti as bhakti. It's jnana. You see, a tantrika should look at jnana and say, ah, bhakti. Or look at bhakti and say, ah, jnana. A tantrika must look at purusha and say, ah, prakriti. And look at prakriti and say, ah, purusha. Say to nirguna. If nirguna appears, ah, mother kali. Mother kali appears, ah, brahman. You see, these are not two. They are one. Masculine and feminine. So to develop in a balanced way as a spiritual practitioner, you should develop both. You're both man and woman. You know, don't pretend you're just man. For the masculine practitioners in the room, and I'm not talking about your gender, masculine practitioners in the room who like jnana, stop pretending like you're just a jnani. Pray, God damn it. <laughs> Get on your knees. <laughs> Fall to your face in front of mother and accept the mother. You will be sorry if you don't, you know, I promise you. Accept the mother and great disaster will be averted. Take the case of Totapuri, Keshav. You must accept the mother. You know, find that feminine bhakta in you. The word bhakti, by the way, is feminine. Jnana is masculine. Again, another clue. Now the bhaktas in the room, please do not hide behind a veil of tears. Stand up, be fierce. Be strong. Discover the inner lion in you, the man in you, the steel, toxic masculinity and all of that. Say with Swami Vivekananda, what fear? I have nothing to fear. Say, if God herself came and tried to rewrite the truth for me, I would look at her and say, cute. Mother, you sit down. I'm going to teach you now. You should have that conviction. As a jnani, you should mansplain to Makali, right? And by the way, there are all these beautiful stories of Mother Kali appearing to people and saying, I want to hear a discourse. Tell me something. She loves Vedanta. She loves to learn Vedanta. She was very fond of Shankara, right? He had visions of her and everything. So remember that Kali likes to hear Vedanta. So you should find that inner Vedanta in you. And when she comes, she's like, um, I think Vignana. You say, wait, no, come, I'll debate you. Advaita Kevala, let's go. Shankara is right. Gaudapada is right. Don't you fool me, mother. I know with my whole heart that Gaudapada is right. I will debate you, right? Like, have the courage to debate God, I think, if she appears to you. She'd like it, I think. Anyway, so that's, that's the first clue that I think we get, that man and female must be balanced. Um, now look at this, 277. We get something interesting here. Um, okay. At attribute to yourself the bliss of God consciousness. Then you too will experience ineffable joy. The bliss of God consciousness always exists in you. It is only hidden by the veiling and projecting power of Maya. Come on. Why would you say Sri Ramakrishna is only just this? He's talking Avarana Shakti and Vignana Shakti, uh, sorry, Vikshepa Shakti. This is pulled almost directly from Vidyaranya Swami's Panchadeshi. There's Maya. Maya has Avarana Shakti, the veiling power, and she has Vikshepa Shakti, the projecting power. So this God consciousness, which is an ineffable joy, Satchit Ananda, that is always inherent in you, is being veiled over by Maya. The less you are attached to the world, the more you love God. You know, and then and then look now he says, um, the jnani seeks to realize Brahman. So this is also on page two hundred seventy seven, right? The jnani seeks to realize Brahman, but the ideal of the bhakta is the personal God, a God endowed with omnipotence and the six treasures like Virya, Shri, Vairagya, like all that. Um, yet, yet, see, he's saying yet, the jnani wants this, the bhakta wants that. They're not different. He's saying yet. Uh, Brahman and Shakti are in fact not different. That which is the blissful mother is again 
existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. They are like the gem and its luster. When one speaks of the luster of the gem, one thinks of the gem. And again, when one speaks of the gem, one refers to its luster. One cannot conceive of the luster of the gem without thinking of the gem. And when one cannot conceive of the gem without thinking of its luster. Existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute is one and one only, but it is associated with different limiting adjuncts, upadis, on account of the different degrees of its manifestation. That is why one finds various forms of God. The devotee sings, oh, my divine mother, thou art all these. Wherever you see actions like creation, preservation, and dissolution, there is the manifestation of Shakti. Water is water, whether it is calm or full of waves and bubbles. The absolute alone is primordial energy, which creates, preserves, and destroys. You know, this is very important. They are one and not two. So in begging you to study this text with me, I'm saying bhaktas in the room, this is the gem the luster will be that much more apparent the closer you get to the gem. To take the gem and its luster apart breaks my heart, right? Because to take Shiva and Shakti apart, I as a tantrika cannot sit by in good faith and allow the dichotomization of bhakti and jnana to continue without saying something. So what Sri Ramakrishna is saying here about the gem and the luster, this was in my experience. Uh, oh, oh, so this is <laughs> good. Some, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> this is Aprokshana Bhuti. And, you know, we haven't actually started talking about it. I'm going to say a few things. But I think this is enough. I want, we were, so this is Aprokshana Bhuti. Um, and we're going to introduce chap, verse 4 very quickly. <laughs> I spent a little more time here than I thought I would. <laughs> but I think it's good. So um, here's the point, though. The, when I came home from the retreat from Divyananda Prana Mataji's lecture, I think what she was conveying was the gem, that Shiva aspect. Oh, yes, absolutely. I will. Pray. Don't worry. It's coming. So, and, and by the way, like, I'll definitely do that. So it's coming from the gem. Divinanda Prada Mataji was giving the, shak, the Shiva aspect, right? And then I came home and looked at Makali, Adhya Shakti, the primordial energy. And it really seemed that there was more luster. She was so much more beautiful. And I couldn't explain why Bhakti felt so much sweeter after a jnana absorption. And then I was like, oh... The gem and its luster. The more Shiva you experience, the more Shakti you experience. The more Shakti you experience, the more Shiva you experience. So think of all of this as a guided meditation. Aprokshana Bhuti is a guided meditation. Verse by verse, you're being led into Shiva. Shankara is going to hold our hand now. And it's not Shankara, by the way. It's Sri Hari. He's saying Sri Hari. Paramanandam, the greatest, highest bliss. Bliss itself is the teacher. He's going to hold our hand and take us step by step to the roof. Once we get to the roof, then he stops. His only job, okay, the only job of this text is to take you to the roof. Once you get to the roof, it's your party. You can cry if you want to. So once you get to the, <laughs> once you get to the roof, then you can do whatever you want. Then it's time to climb down the roof and say, it's all brick and brick dust and lime. But get to the roof first, Baba. Get to the roof first. You know, don't from the bottom of the roof say, because someone told me all these steps are brick, brick, dust, and lime. Okay, I believe the roof is also that. No, wait. You have to experience it for yourself. Don't believe all these monks. Don't believe them. Do you know why I say that? They are right. But don't you want to know for yourself? Are you content with mere religion? Why? Why be content with what a book says, what a monk says, what a person on the internet says? Don't stop there. Reject everything until it's true for you. See for yourself. Inquire into it. Try everything. So Swamiji, in the introduction, oh, sorry, in Raja Yoga first steps, or maybe an introduction in Raja Yoga, he says, the yogi must take this attitude. It's only true if it's true for me. I have to try it. I have to, I have, to have the, the faith, the shraddha, that what the monks and nuns and masters and people are saying are true, but I can't accept that and leave, that, leave it at that. I have, to, I have to work and see for myself. So the invitation of Aprokshana Bhuti, I'm going to type that in the chat now, is to have this aparokshanubhuti. Apara, oh, sorry, uh, apara aksha anubhuti. I'll break up all these words. Aksha anubhuti. So let's explain this again. Verse 2 tells us that the purpose of this text is aparokshanabhuti, or rather what it teaches is aparokshanabhuti. Para means with others. Aksha means eyes. Apara aksha means that which is not given by testimony. 
through other people's eyes. Anubhuti means experience. So aprakshanabhuti means a direct experience, not mediated through the testimony of others, nor is it even mediated through the senses. It's an immediate experiential recognition of your true nature as Brahman. So please refer to the second installment in the lecture series, where we really talk about what aprakshanabhuti is. We compare it to pratyaksha, direct observation. We compare it to paraaksha, which can mean testimony, or it can mean reason or inference or mystical experience. And we say how aprakshanabhuti is actually even beyond mystical experience. It's even beyond reason or testimony. It's even beyond direct eyewitness accounts. It's deeper than that. That's why Swami Vivekananda says, Brahman cannot be known. And then we're like, aw. And after that, Swamiji says, Brahman can be more than known. You know, it's not known. It's more than known. What does he mean? Aprokshnabhuti. So just for like the purposes of completion, the reason why we're learning this is for renunciation. Here, Sri Ramakrishna said that as you become less attached to the world, you become more in love with God and vice versa, right? So if nothing else, the reason this text will give you bhakti is because it will cultivate vairagya, renunciation. So let's see what renunciation is. So quick, okay, here's, here's the first four verses of Aprakshanabhuti. I hope you don't mind that we're going up to 7.30. I was trying to end at 7, but you know, what to do? <laughs> So then we'll do Q&A and I'll stick around for extra long today, just because it's a particularly inspired day. We'll just stay for as long as you want and as long as you would like to debate all of these topics. My, my, my spiel will be done in just a bit and then we can have a little bit of a more interactive session, hopefully more of a debate and some questions and answers. So let's go through four verses just so we can make some progress into the text. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chant the opening verse now. You can join me if you know it, if you have the text. Om Shri Harim Paramanandam Upadeshtaram Ishwaram Vyapakam Sarvalokanam Karanam Tam Namam Yaham Om salutations to that Lord Hari, the attractive one, who is himself the highest bliss, bliss itself, who alone is the teacher of the world. O oh, salutations to that spiritual cause, karana, of the sarvaloka nam, of the appearance of all the worlds, that all-pervading bliss, to that one I bow. Okay, verse 2. So verse 1 is a prayer to the Guru, to God. And we covered verse 1 in two lectures, actually, because there was so much there to unpack. So the first two lectures in this series were all about verse 1. Then lecture... The, no, no, first, lecture two and three were about verse one. Lecture one was introduction. So then, then next we looked at this verse. Aparokshanu bhutirvai prochyate moksha siddhaye sadbireva prayatne na vikshaniya muhur muhur. Now this verse means, this text, remember, in the study of non-duality, we have to have anubandha chatushtaya, which is this question. What does the text teach? What is the goal? What's the link between the context of the text and the goal? And to whom is this text addressed? These four things must be told to you before you study any text. So here is the Anubandha Chatushtaya. And it says, the text teaches the Aprokshanabhuti. This text is an exposition on Aprokshanabhuti for the purposes of attaining liberation, moksha. So Aprokshanabhuti is itself a term that means liberation. So really, by the end of this text, you could be liberated, meaning samadhi. Isn't that interesting? I mean, not necessarily samadhi, but very much conducive to samadhi. I think that's so thrilling that by the end of 144 verses, you'll have everything you need to go into samadhi, if, if that's even a goal. Uh, you might even be beyond the need for samadhi at that point. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure some non dualists feel that way. Okay, uh, so, but this is important. Sadbir eva. Only for the good people. Prayat nena, vikshaniya, muhur muhur. Is worthy of being looked into again and again, muhur muhur, by the good people. Sadbir, only the good people, Sadbir Eva. So only the good people or the virtuous people or the true people can look into this again and again and thereby attain Aprokshanabhuti, which is synonymous with liberation. So there is a, you must be this tall to ride the ride kind of thing. And that's, I think, a very important thing that's going to happen in the next few verses. So from verses three to nine, we're about to hear what you need to be to study non-duality. Like, what qualifications do you need to have to realize the truth of this text? Most of us who study non-duality and are not getting the fruits thereof really should pay attention to verses 3 through 9. 
as Swami Vivekananda would say, I know where the shoe pinches. In other words, I know what the problem is. And that's a lack of these nine qualities. I'm oh, sorry, these, these, uh, yeah, these nine qualities. But interestingly, we already have them to some degree, right? The fact that you're here is a demonstration that you are the Sadbir, the true people. It's an hour and a half, right? As my wife tells me, you got to stop with these hour and a half lectures. Who can, you yourself won't be able to sit for a lecture for more than 45 minutes. Why do you subject all these people to, you know, and I'm like, it's not up to me. I, I'm trying. <laughs> but um, because we are already demonstrating this, it's only a matter of cultivation, right? So verse three starts to tell us how to become the sadbir, how to become the worthy people of this text. So here's verse three, which we covered last week. Svavarnashrama dharmena tapasa haritoshanat sadhanam prabhavet pumsam vairagyadi chatushtayam. By performing one's duties appropriate to one's own vocation and one's own stage in life, by performing austerities and by devotion to the Lord Hari, one verily attains the various qualifications, Vairagya and the others. That's a rather loose translation, but I think it gets to the essence of it. So these words, Sva, Varna, Ashrama, Dharma, the Dharma, your task according to your caste, to your stage in life, etc., etc. We had a whole discussion about caste last week, Ashrama, all of that. Um, and we explained why these things themselves are tapasyas. Why they actually, living with others, I think we can all attest, right? Living with a spouse, that's tapasya. <laughs> Once a nun said to me, it's tapasya living with other people. <laughs> yes. Isn't that interesting? It's tapasya. <laughs> so that, but he also means like other spiritual practices as well. And then this is so important. Harito shanat, devotion to the Lord. So the qualification that you need to study this text is bhakti. Only bhaktas have a right to like pick up this text. Isn't that interesting? The, so again, the dichotomy of jnana and bhakti is like thrashed because you see here that only bhaktas are worthy to, to, to study this because only bhaktas have the purity of heart for this knowledge, you know? So through your bhakti practice, through austerity, through performing your duties in the world, such as karma yoga, through doing these things, you become equipped with all these uh, vairagyadi chatushtaya. So vairagya is renunciation. Adi means like etc. So vairagya adi means vairagya etc. And now we're going to get nine, no less than nine qualifications, starting with vairagya. So I'm just going to read verse four so we can make some progress into the text and we'll, we'll I think, leave it there. So verse four is, Brahma dishtavaranteshu vairagyam vishayeshvanu yataiva kaka vishtayam vairagyam tadhi nirmalam. That always cracks me up. Kaka means crow. <laughs> so this says pure vairagya. You know, so pure vairagya is aversion towards all sense pleasures from the world of Brahma down to immobile objects um, like you would feel regarding the refuse of a crow. So you should be as disinterested in heaven and earth as you are in a crow's droppings. <laughs> kind of gross, but I think what Shankara is trying to say here is the, the same way you regard crow's droppings, which is with slight aversion and not that much interest, you should have that level of aversion to all the heavens and the sense enjoyments of the world. That's pure vairagya. But wait, do, can any of us claim that we have that kind of vairagya? Of course not. You know, how do you get that vairagya? Through bhakti. By falling in love with God, more and more, you fall out of love with the various sense pleasures in the world. But until you have this vairagya, it's very hard to do this text, right? So vairagya, this level of vairagya is being endorsed. So one must look upon the world and also the heavens with as much disinterest as one regards crow's droppings. That is what is called the highest vairagya. So let me make very briefly, uh, and I will definitely continue this much more next week, a philosophical point as to why vairagya is important. I can do this very briefly. It's very simple, actually. This is, remember, not a cultural point. It's not a moralistic point. The reason vairagya, renunciation, is important for aprokshanabhuti is this. Aprokshanabhuti is the experience of the subject apart from all of the objects that appear in it. Most of us are trained throughout all of our life to recognize only objects. Yes, I think that's a great way of putting it. Renunciation. By the way, how many of us, when we're crushing on someone, are perfect renunciants? 
How many of us stay up all night to talk to our beloved? Texting, right? We can sacrifice sleep for our beloved. How many of us go without food so we can take the train and go see our beloved? You know, like we're all like the perfect yogi is a young boy in love, a young woman in love, a young person in love. They're like the ultimate. So if you fall in love with God, it's the same thing. You easily renounce everything else. Like, by the way, on your way to your beloved's house, if someone tries to catch you and say, I'm going to give you a thousand dollars or whatever, you might be like, ugh, you'd be averse to that as you would be to crow's droppings because you've got somewhere to be. You have no time to talk to this person about their thousand dollar scam or whatever. You know, I'm not going to be part of your abundance loom or whatever other internet pyramid scheme that you're calling multi-level media marketing. So I don't know. I'm just going to run to go see my beloved. So yes, you're right, Marcia. I think it's a beautiful, Kalika is saying beautifully that renunciation is an act of love. So here, why do you need it though? So whether we have it or not, let's just understand philosophically why it's important. Look, you cannot, and I emphasize this, have aprochna bhuti um, if you're attached to the world. By that, I mean, if you are fascinated with the objects of your experience, aprochna bhuti is highly unlikely. Why? Because of this. Okay, this is why. Aprochna bhuti is an experience of the subject. Brahman is not any thoughts we can have about Brahman. It's the subject in which those thoughts come and go. Now, our whole life, we are trained to only be fascinated with objects. So from our very infancy, our direction, our, our, our um, attention is directed outwards towards objects. So we believe that objects out there in the world will make us happy. To the degree that we believe that, we won't even come to spiritual life, Right. Like if we think that the world makes us happy, why take an hour and a half out of your Friday night to listen to some crazy guy talk on the internet? It's, it must be because you recognize the limitations of material happiness. You know that going to the club and getting people's numbers and having a wild night out is fun, but not ultimately fulfilling. You know that all the sense pleasures, though they can be fun for a time, cannot ultimately fulfill you. You recognize that these objects, these sense objects aren't it. As someone once said on TikTok, that ain't it. Right? You recognize this. You have that sense. So, but yet, yet you can't avoid being fascinated by them. They're objects. Each of these things are sense objects. They are that which appears to you. Right. So the mind is trained to be attracted to that only, to look at that only. And insofar as you're looking at the object, you're missing the subject. So the object in many ways blurs, or I would say even better, veils the subject in which it appears. So I'm not looking inward insofar as I'm looking outward. It's as simple as that. And outward, by the way, means also physical sensations, but it also means thoughts. So all my thoughts are objects as well. So if I get attached to a particular philosophy like Advaita Vedanta, I'm lost. But you know why we get attached? Because we're object-oriented. So we want God to be an object. This is why most of us don't like non-duality because God is not an object in non-duality. But we feel comfortable looking at things as objects. So we want objects. We want this thought or that thought. I want this philosophy. I want to identify as a Shaiva. I want to identify as a Vignana Vadin. I want to identify as an Advaita Vadin. All of these are just thoughts. They're just noise in the mind. They're all just objects. What it means to have renunciation is to move your attention away from what you are thinking towards that you are thinking. It's to become less interested in the content of your experience and more interested in the context of your experience. Because aprokshana bhuti is the recognition of the awareness in which all your experiences come and go. So insofar as you are chasing experiences, whether they're sensual experiences or mystical experiences or mental experiences or intellectual experiences, whatever. Insofar as your fascination is with objects, you will always miss the subject in which those objects come and go. So the reason renunciation is needed is because without renunciation, your mind will be way too cluttered. So take an example. If you sit for meditation, what will happen? Objects will appear to you. So from behind closed eyelids, all manner of images will appear. There will be your cat, there will be your car, there will be your work, there will be your friends. In other words, objects. All of these are various objects in your experience, right? So why are you so fascinated? Because we haven't yet developed aversion towards objects. We're still so attached to objects. So meditation won't work. We sit there and try to meditate. We're really just going to be meditating on objects. So the only way you can come into contact with the subject is to diminish your fascination with objects, mental, psychic, emotional, and sensual. 
Thank you. Because this is what renunciation really is. Don't think it's moralistic or cultural. Renunciation is a means to an end. What's that end? The end is the thought-free, spacious quality of the mind in which the truth just flashes into uh, your awareness. Like immediately you're made aware that, oh, you see, and I'll, I, I think we're just about now coming into questions. You see, real renunciation is finishing with thoughts. It's not giving up your car, although that could be helpful for many of us. It's not like living under minimum wage. No, you could have a nice healthy check at the end of the month. You could have a nice comfortable car and be in a nice comfortable home, but your mind could be cluttered. And you could be in a shack in the Himalayas and your mind could still be cluttered. Obviously, it's not about what's there in your space, but what's there in your mind. That's why Swami Vivekananda says a king on his golden throne could be a better renunciant than a beggar in the shack. Because it's about to what degree are you attached to the object because the more you attach the object, the last thing I'll say, then um, the less you'll notice the subject. And Aparakshana Bhutti is entirely the experience of the subject recognizing itself. That's what renunciation is for. So let's close here. Um, and let's go into the Q&A now. So I'm just going to chant the closing mantra from the Upanishads. And please, let's debate, let's talk, let's interact. All right. Om Danur Grihitva Upanishadam Mahastram Sharam upasa nishitam samdaita ayam ya tadbhavagatena chitasa lakshyam tadevaksharam somya vidhi o matmanam chidvijaniyat ayam asmiti purushaha kimichan kasya kamaya shariram manu sangjwaret Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rapanamastu Om Pick up the mighty bow of the Upanishads Place upon it the arrow of your mind sharpened through meditation. Draw back the bowstring of renunciation and strike upon thy target consciousness, bliss absolute, the self. If one is to recognize this self, then desiring what and for whose sake should one suffer along with the fevers of the body? Om, may this be an offering to my teacher. Om, peace, peace, peace.